spent a good amount of my teenage years working as a climbing guide in Kenya, in East Africa, and you tend to see a number of things. So, you know, I've seen everything from people getting gored by wild animals to, you know, taken falls while free soloing and basically the full package. A lot of, a lot of things. It's an interesting country to be a climber in here in Kenya. So anyway, the story I'd like to tell today is it's probably not the closest I've come to meeting my demise, but it's definitely the most prolonged, you know, brutal, exhausting experience that I'd ever lived through. So it was the it was the 23rd of June 2017. I was 18 years old at the time and I and a friend of mine wanted to climb the north face of Batia on Mount Kenya. Mount Kenya is the second highest mountain in Africa. Batia is the highest peak on Mount Kenya. And the north face of Batia is one of the most feared and respected mountain faces on the African continent. So Robert and I were both guides on the mountain. Robert was primarily a trekking guide. I was a technical climbing guide at the time. We used to work together and we just wanted to take a run up the mountain ourselves, see how the mountain looked. An important thing to note is that the two days building up to this climb, Mount Kenya had been battered by extreme winds and the wind was still blowing on the day that we were going to climb. I'd only had about five hours of proper sleep over a period of about 50 hours of physical exertion and whatnot. So as much as I felt good and psyched and I was ready to climb, there was a little, there was a little something back there, a little fatigue that was starting to creep in. So anyway, we woke up at about 3 a.m. and we marched up to the, to the base of the North Face. It's a beautiful route. It starts in a gully with very steep sides. And if you're still in the gully by the time the sun hits the route, then there's a lot of rock fall. So usually you have to move through the gully very, very quickly. There's a lot of loose rocks. So people have to be very, very careful. Anyway, so we continued climbing, climbing pitch after pitch, pitch after pitch. And we got up to a section of the route known as the amphitheater, which is like a massive, half football stadium of rock, that's what it looks like, that steepens dramatically towards the end. And we could hear sort of a sound like jet aircrafts just flying over, flying over. And that was the wind, extremely, extremely powerful wind that was just blowing through the mountain. You're blowing past these rocks, just creating an incredibly loud sound. And once we got up to the upper slabs of the amphitheater, it was almost impossible to keep our balance and trying to lead those pitches was just brutal. It was hell, couldn't hear anything, couldn't look down to place your feet because you couldn't breathe when you did that. And so it was pretty nasty. And I think we should have, at that point, we should have known that what we were doing was, you know, was silly, but we didn't think of it that way. So we got up to the top of the amphitheater then we went round to the back of a massive feature called Fermin's Tower. And, you know, from there, that's on the west, it's sheltered. The wind was coming from a northeasterly direction. So once we went round the corner, the wind was gone. And in our minds, you know, everything was fine. We just kept climbing, we kept climbing, we kept climbing. And, you know, 18 pitches, that route is. It's about 18 pitches. It's a pretty big route with a lot of long sections of running belays. And so we got up to the ridge before getting to the summit, which is, you know, a narrow, narrow ridge with massive drops on either side of it. And so we were going across the ridge and we were getting towards, towards the summit. And that's when I noticed something was wrong with Robert. This particular day, he was really slow. And, you know, when he got up to me on one of the last pitches towards the summit is when I realized what exactly was wrong. He was hicking. He kept hicking up and he'd hick up a sort of clear, viscous fluid out of his mouth. And obviously at first I was freaking out. I was thinking, is this pulmonary edema, you know, what is it? And so when I inspected his chest and sort of listened, 
it didn't turn out to be high altitude pulmonary edema, which was a relief. Uh, what it did end up being was actually quite strange. It was heartburn. It wasn't extremely serious, but it was definitely slowing him down, definitely giving us problems. So anyway, we stood on the summit and we were happy, celebrated. That's a 5,200 meters above sea level. So, you know, it's quite, it's quite a high peak. We began the descent. We started descending off the summit, you know, making our way along the ridge, just sort of scrambling. And the sun was you know, beginning its descent. And the sun rays were hitting me, hitting me on my back. It was warm. And suddenly that's when the sleep deprivation hit me and I just felt this really slow, relaxed feeling that I've never felt before anywhere else. And I was terrified because at this point we were way up on the mountain, up on the ridge. We had a long way to go. So as soon as I noticed that, you know, I snapped right out of it and got back to work and sort of, sort of forgot about, forgot about everything. And we just kept going. We just kept going. We needed to get off the mountain. So by the time the sun was dipping below the horizon, below the blanket of clouds on the horizon, we were above a section of the mountain called the knife edge. I sort of just got in reach of the slings and there was the wind just on. The wind just smacking us in the face. And, you know, instantly sort of, you almost lose your balance because it's so powerful. It's like a raging torrent of water, essentially. And we realized we had to work very quick because it was cold and the sun had gone down. The temperature was going to drop. So <clears throat> I get this rope. We had two ropes, a blue rope and a green rope. Both ropes are brand new. So I took out the green rope, threaded the green rope through the rings, the tat and the anchor, and prepared to throw it. Very good. The rope was coiled, ready to throw, and we were still being blasted by this wind. So I threw the rope, and you know, many mountaineers know this moment if you're throwing a rope into wind, where the wind just, just catches the rope, and the rope flies back up at you, passed you into the air. And so the rope got hooked, snagged under a massive piece of rock, and then it snagged again slightly higher up. And so, you know, obviously we cursed, that was terrible, because now we were going to be stuck there trying to free this rope. That green rope was tangled so badly by the time we freed it, you know, full of kinks and little knots, that we just stuffed it in the backpack because we knew that would just give us help and we couldn't stay on that ledge for too long. So we took the blue rope, which we'd been using throughout the climb, which is a good rope. And so I set up, you know, to cut, long story short, I set up the abseil and I set it up successfully and I threw down the rope. So now Robert was supposed to wait for me at the top of this pitch as I abseil down to the knife edge itself, anchored myself so he could come down. So I knew I had to work fast because he'd just be sitting still and freezing. I abseiled down the pitch, untangling the rope where I could. And then, you know, in a moment I can only describe as weird. Um, you know, I experienced weightlessness because the wind was so powerful, it would hit the knife edge ridge below and it would come up, it would come up in little waves like this, like this. And so what happened was I sort of, I felt myself being lifted and you'd look up and you'd see the rope and the rope was all slack when it should be tight because you're supposed to be hanging on it full weight. But the thing was, I was actually being lifted, being lifted like this and it lasted a brief moment and you know, it was fascinating, but it was also, it was also absolutely terrifying. So I got to the base of the knife edge pitch above the knife edge ridge and screamed at <laughs> sort of high pitch signal up to Robert because that was the only sound that could transcend the wind. Anything else just, you know, got lost in the wind. And so Robert comes down and when he got down to my position, that's when I realized, oh snap, this guy was frostbitten and his hand was sort of caught in a half grasp like this. And so things were getting, things were getting pretty desperate at that point. We were dehydrated, um, you yeah. know, anyway. We continued, we continued down the mountain, we continued fighting, we continued, we continued fighting. And at one point, Robert's torch came pretty close to dying. I took out my spare batteries and then gave Robert uh, 
because his torch was dying. And so now I knew if my torch ended up dying, that would be a pretty big problem. Yeah, I could look down into the valley. And when I looked down into sort of the blackened void, I could see this little light. And that was the base camp, that was Shipton's, the base camp on the north side of Batian on Mount Kenya. And, you know, it was a long, long, long way away from, uh, from where we were. And it's a pretty depressing feeling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was crazy because as the descent continued, especially those moments when I was sat on the ledges waiting for Robert to arrive, there's this funny feeling of, this feeling of just carelessness that I had. Everything felt like very inconsequential, almost like a dream, because you just sit there and just look into the darkness and think, oh, if I just unclip and slide away, everything it didn't feel real. It was just like a dream. The only sound you could hear is just in your ears. Yeah, you couldn't hear anything anyone was saying. It was just absolutely chaotic. So anyway, we got to the to the amphitheater, to the top of the amphitheater. And at the top of the amphitheater, there's a little notch, which I like to call the wind gap, because precisely that, that's the little funnel that the wind was just shooting through. So I abseiled into the wind gap, and this is when the hallucinations began. I sort of found myself, you know, 15 meters below the anchor in terms of altitude, and also 15 meters out from it. and. Whatever I did, I couldn't get to the anchor. It was extremely difficult. And so even when Robert arrived, we had to perform a very, a very complex maneuver just to get to the slings within the wind gap, which we eventually did. And so we got to the slings within the wind gap, and now it's time to pull down the rope. And so we pulled the rope, we pulled the rope. Mind you, this spot right here, this is the worst hit spot on the mountain in terms of wind. The wind was just you know, just destroying us, absolutely destroying us. Our lips were sandpaper, you know, snot was blowing and freezing out of our noses. We couldn't breathe, we couldn't see, and then we were shivering uncontrollably, you know, pretty close to hypothermic. And then the rope gets stuck. Oh. And it's stuck, it got stuck, proper stuck, you know, between the north face and a massive flake that looked like a peeling eggshell detached from the north face pretty high up and so robert belayed me with what we had left of the blue rope and i went up and there was nowhere to put gear because the only crack there was the crack between the flake and the north face which was pretty wide i didn't have any gear to fit that and so i more or less free soloed uh, with a rope to stop me falling you know, to the base of the mountain, essentially. If I fell, that probably wouldn't have made much of a difference, falling a good 25, 30 meters. But, you know, so I led up this crack, sort of off, off with, and got to a chalk stone where the rope was stuck, and I freed it, and then I down climbed this crack. Mind you, all the while, the wind is just flying through the mountain, you know. Um, if you slip and fall, you, probably been blown a good you'd probably land a good 20 meters from where you'd have landed if gravity just carried you it was extremely powerful and then there was dust being blown up from lower on the mountain just flying into our eyes and just making it extremely difficult so i down climbed this crack i got back to the wind gap to where robert was and we continued the descent so at this point we've made it to the gully it's about it's about 1 45 a.m and we were exhausted. And you know, Robert was still hicking up clear digestive juices. And you know, his arm, his hand was just sort of like this, stuck in a half grasp and you know, almost unusable at that point. And uh, things were thick. Anyway, so I set up an abseil and we started the abseil. So I was leading as usual. So I let out and I get to the end of the rope and you know as half expected the rope hadn't made it to the anchor point in fact there was a good 40 feet of cliff between me 
between the end of the rope and the anchor point. So I thought, okay, this is a section of climbing I've done multiple times in my career, and I was pretty confident that I could just down climb it the way I usually did. So I clipped from the rope and resorted to a free solo down climb, just sort of moving carefully, 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 like that. And I got to about halfway between the end of the rope and the anchor point. Then my torch dies. So now I was left in pitch black. You know, there's the wind in my back, free soloing, not on a rope, trying to down climb a section of slabs. Mind you, every time I blinked, I was hearing things and I was seeing things, so I was hallucinating. And that little part of my brain that was sort of watching this from the back, aware of everything that was happening, was just freaking out. So all I could do was just hold this very awkward position and wait as Robert came down with his torch and then lit up the way. And you know, once he did get to that position, what I did was wait so he could pull down the rope and then you know, put it on his back. And then I could direct him somewhat and then we could both move together with his light to the next anchor point. And my torch dying made everything 10 times more difficult than it should have been. Now Robert wasn't in a state to be leading abseils because A, he actually didn't have enough experience to be leading abseils. The thing was, as I said, he was a trekking guide, not a climbing guide, but because the two of us were just sort of two guys and we thought, oh, let's climb the mountain the way we'd done before. We, we'd sort of, yeah, we'd just run up there. And at that time, I should probably have, I should have been smarter. Yeah. Should have really put emphasis on training in terms of setting up abseils. You know, on a good day with clear weather, with blue skies, it probably would have been a better alternative to have him set the abseils. But you know, it was dark, it was windy. His hand was, was in really, really bad shape. So I was still the more viable candidate to be setting up the abseils. Now mind you, I couldn't have the torch while setting up those abseils. I had to do it in the dark. And this is because Robert, being the second person following, would easily knock down 10 big rocks per abseil because there's so many loose rocks in this section of the route. So he had to have the torch every single pitch so he could see the rocks, so he wouldn't knock them down on my head, especially on the sections where I didn't have any cover. So I was leading these abseils, pitch black, you know, hallucinating, tripping like I was on the hardest drugs known to man because of, because of how little I'd slept over all those days put together. It, you know, it was madness. I really, I really think back, actually, I think back to that, to that whole experience and just wonder, you know, how on earth we made it off, off that mountain, how we actually did those abseils. Because, yeah, I'll give you an example. Those of you who've been so drunk where, you know, you wake up in your bed the next morning and you sort of, oh, yeah, you remember getting home, but you don't quite remember how. You know, for me, when I look back at the final hours of that descent, that's exactly how it feels, just multiplied by 10. You know, it was, it was crazy. It was just madness. You know, I was hearing music and from the, the camp that's, you know, miles away, I'd find myself inside the caretaker's room, listening to traditional Kikuyu music and it was warm and it was nice and everything. Then, you know, reality snaps in and you're still on the mountain. I remember telling Robert early on that that day or that night when things had gotten really thick, promising that we'd sleep you know, in a warm bed that evening, that we wouldn't sleep out on the rocks. So I was very determined. You know, we also we really needed to get off that mountain because we were in really, really bad shape. And you know, I was 18 years old, you know, obviously I didn't have kids, I didn't have any of those things, but Robert did. And that had played on my mind the entire climb because I was responsible for this guy. So eventually we got, we were getting pretty close to the ground. And I remember because of how desperate things were getting, I was walking out way ahead of Robert, sort of in the pitch dark, 
And then when it was so bad that I couldn't see anything, I just sit and wait for him. So I was sitting down and then all these fantasies would come in and then occasionally the soberness would snap back in and I'd wake up and I'd freak out and I'd, you know, I'd be really pissed off at Robert and I'd tell him, you know, I'd tell him to move, you know, I'd grab him like this and looking him in the eye and then tell him that we really needed to move because I genuinely felt like it would reach a point when I just pass out completely. And I'd have much rather that point came when we were off the wall itself rather than a good 100 feet up it, you know? So we get to the final belay point and we've got one pitch, one pitch to go, you know, one pitch before we hit the dirt, then we can hike back to camp. And so the blue rope had somehow ended up getting extremely tangled and kinky and knotted, all that nonsense between between the gully and the final, you know, the final abseil. And so we were working, we were working to thread this rope back through itself when, you know, out of the blue, Robert's torch just boom. Yeah, that was, that was one of those moments where you just, where you just think, oh, this can't get any worse. And we were both sick and just finished and dangerously dehydrated as well. We weren't just going to give up like that because we were there, we were right next to the ground, yeah, but we couldn't see anything. So what we ended up doing is something I like to call torch CPR. Took out the batteries, rubbed them, rubbed them, everything we could do so we could get off the mountain, so we could see, so we could thread this rope back through itself, so we could get out of the wind, get to the base of the mountain and get to the camp. You know, before, before we both collapsed on the mountain. And so that's what we did, torch CPR. We got the torch working, wonderful. Robert lit the way, threaded the rope back through itself. Then we set up the abseil. Just before leaning over the edge, that last abseil, I looked at Robert, looked at him and I told him, you know, see on the other side, brother. You know, he looked back at me, said the same thing. That was quite a moment. I went over the edge, and there's a little memorial plaque, or a placard, at the base of the route, silver, commemorating two climbers that died on the peak in 1990. And you know, I saw that, and you know, there's a lot you think about when you've made it off a climb like that. I, you know, when you've battled for so many hours to get off the mountain. And that was a surreal moment. That was a very surreal moment. And so I unclipped from the rope and shouted the signal up to Robert and then then Robert came down and we met. So I was just at the base and well, we hugged. And that was great. It was a wonderful moment. We pulled down the rope and then we simply walked like two drunkards, quite literally. Um, you know, the one or the two kilometers through the scree slopes and the boulder fields. You know, luckily no one twisted an ankle. We walked into the campsite, you know, just looking rough. 24 hours, mind you, since we left the campsite. Now it's you know, nearly 4 a.m. the next morning from when we left, and we barely drank any water. We hadn't eaten any food, which wasn't too bad, but we'd lost a ton of energy, shivering and just fighting to get out of the elements, fighting to get off the mountain during the storm. And then there was me who was essentially half dead. My brain was just shutting down piece by piece from just being, from just not having slept and from having put my body through so much during a period of so much sleep deprivation. And so we drunk, drunk that cold river water like Madness just drunk that water and then just crawled into crawled into our sleeping bags like the like caterpillars at the end of their half lives. You now just completely finished, just shut down. Hands down the best sleep that that I'd ever had. And yeah. It's one of those days that I thought I don't want to be an alpinist anymore. I don't want to be a climber. But, you know, that all changes. 
That's my story. I hope it's it's been entertaining. Thank you very much.